Thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, it's great to be here. I want to thank the organizers very much. Been uh, immensely efficient, uh, more efficient than I could ever be. And so it's quite nice to be under, under the control of a, an efficient organization, which doesn't mean Singapore. Um, uh, Quingy just uh, gave you, uh, by way of uh, introduction, uh, something of my uh, uh, peregrinations uh, across the world. But I'm not going to speak about the world. Someone was uh, very concerned yesterday that I might be speaking about the world. I'm actually not. Um, and it's in three parts, uh, my presentation. It's predominantly visual, uh, but I, I'll just guide you through. Uh, it begins with the Biennale of Sydney in 2006. It's a two-year uh, project, as a Biennale uh, is. Of course, in other countries, Biennales often take three years, but they're still called Biennales. Uh, so it was a, a, uh, an extraordinary experience for me, certainly, because uh, the Biennale of Sydney, which began in the 1970s, is an important Biennale, certainly in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it was especially important early on because there weren't, uh, there weren't many Biennales at that time. Uh, and uh, I guess it, Australia still is very remote. I, I was educated there, born in Scotland, but educated in Australia. And this sense of remoteness was something that, that uh, continued I think it continues to today. It's a strange place in a way because it's, um, there's a kind of twofold colonization, colonization uh, of the indigenous people by white Australians and white Australians of course being mostly Irish and, uh, and Scottish and uh, English uh, sent out as convicts uh, for stealing a pig or something uh, strange like that. And so, uh, this kind of double colonization uh, makes Australia a particular, a particular case. As well, of course, its location being uh, south, of, uh, uh, south of what we call south, south of, uh, of Asia, uh, places uh, put it in a position of some isolation. I say this by way of preface because uh, it means that the Biennale has so often uh, in its uh, long history, 30-year history or so, uh, reflected it's uh, Anglo-European uh, roots. Um, and uh, having lived in different parts of the world uh, by then, I realized that uh, it was a very uh, one-sided or two-sided uh, picture. So <clears throat> I traveled to about 57 countries, which almost killed me, but uh, I'm still alive, but I don't have a travel bug anymore. That's how you get rid of it. Uh, and uh, I paid particular attention uh, not only to South America where I'd lived uh, and worked for a number of years, but also uh, to uh, the Middle East uh, and to a degree uh, Asia. Uh, but I feel now, six years later, uh, somewhat shamefaced about uh, my uh, trips to Asia, that they weren't thorough enough, that they were far too quick uh, in terms of the different countries. And I've only come to really learn that in the past three years, uh, living and working uh, out of in Singapore. So I just want to run through uh, some, of the, some of the work uh, that uh, I showed uh, in the Biennale. Uh, I called it uh, Zones of Contact. And again, six years later, even now, uh, just looking at the material in terms of uh, preparation for, um, for today's uh, talk, um, I feel that zones of contact was probably uh, the wrong name for it. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll come to that. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through um, some, of the, some of the material. And I'm speaking, I might, I might just add here um, that I'm speaking from the point of view of a curator. I'm not speaking from the point of view of an art historian. Uh, I was an art historian. I seem to have retired from uh, making of art history or from the writing of art history, and I've become uh, just a sort of straightforward 
uh, curator trying to direct a small institute. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the institute uh, after, uh, after I've, I've uh, ushered in the, uh, the Biennale. I'm just going to show you uh, a handful of artists um, and uh, just run through them uh, quite quickly. Um, I don't have a clock, so I have no idea uh, of time, but you'll warn me. No? Don't say one minute. Give me five, you know. Okay. Um, so, Mona Hatom. Many of these works were uh, commissioned, uh, <clears throat> but there were 85 artists in the show, uh, and we did it across about 15 venues. One thing that I did want to, and I still, I, I still went even more in the, in, the, in the situation, in the context of Singapore, I, do I did want to reach different communities, and that's a plural communities. In Singapore, there's some idea of a community as being singular, uh, which has to, more to do with vote catching than anything else, and a kind of strange national populism uh, which uh, characterizes uh, the government uh, of Singapore. Uh, this is the uh, Achillesans from the Philippines. Uh, Amar Kanwa, uh, Indian uh, filmmaker, artist filmmaker. This is uh, referring uh, to uh, the border with uh, Pakistan and the exchange of goods. Uh, this is uh, Jay Salum. Uh, who worked a lot in the, in the Balkan region, uh, but is based in Canada. Uh, this is uh, the, a, a two-screen uh, video, uh, one of it uh, simply taken from the train running through the Balkans, uh, and the other uh, of different people, uh, r uh, intellectuals, historians, uh, speaking about uh, the, the Balkan history. Uh, Celia Kamerich. Uh, there are two artists that I did uh, also were able to uh, get uh, a company uh, who do a lot of street uh, posters, uh, what are they called, Jesse uh, Dassault, uh, to, to do. And she's from, uh, she was living, she, wa she is from Sarajevo. Uh, uh, Gazelle. Lives in France. Emily Jassia who lives uh, between New York and, and, uh, and uh, Ramallah. This was a, a work uh, which was based on, uh, on the, uh, the, the writings uh, uh, of a famous uh, Palestinian intellectual who, who was assassinated in Rome uh, and uh, he was translating A Thousand and One Nights into Italian. And she, um, she did these books, A Thousand and One Books, which were, which were blank, uh, and there was a bullet hole in each of the books. Um, and she learned, to, she learned to shoot a gun. Uh, well, th this was part of <coughs> the process of making a... Uh, such, a, uh, such a biennale. She learned to shoot a gun in, in Sydney. She went to a, what do, you, what do you call them? A shooting range, whatever, uh, and practiced to be able to shoot the bullet, bu uh, a bullet into the front of the... So each one of these had, uh, had a bullet hole. Uh, the Atlas Group, or Walid Rad, and he did a, uh, one of his uh, famous uh, lectures, presentations, in which he talked about uh, Lebanon and the machinations of, of, uh, of Beirut and uh, uh, the kind of connections in and out of, of the government and, 
uh, the kind of mafia that existed at that time in Beirut. And you can, I, I got another just to. Uh, Akram Satari, uh, also from Beirut, uh, uh, digging up evidence, uh, evidence of, uh, to do with the ownership of, of a house. This was in the garden of a house that had been appropriated uh, after, the, after its owners had left, uh, left the country. Uh, this is uh, Tomic, uh, miniature Tomic. Um, who uh, Serbia um, uh, from Belgrade, and uh, we got some containers. Uh, one container, this container, uh, we managed to. We have to purchase it, um, and then uh, she shot uh, shot the container. Um, the uh, she had read many stories of uh, people being uh, executed by being herded into the container and then uh, dropped into a lake. Uh, and uh, there's some reference to, to, I mean, there is a reference to that incident which happened in various parts of the world. Um, again, a shooting uh, uh, project which uh, was very complicated because uh, we didn't know where to have it shot. It couldn't be in the city, so we had to uh, <clears throat> take it 100 kilometers out of, out of Sydney uh, and then uh, get someone who knew uh, how, to, how to shoot a container uh, from a, a good distance because obviously there could be ricocheted. So it, it took a while to actually do something which ends up being so simple. Uh, Adrian Pachi. He, uh, he uh, now lives, uh, he now lives in, uh, in Italy, um, but uh, originally from Albania. Kalindan. Uh, this is... Uh, Hassan uh, from Cairo. Henry Salah from Albania, uh, but based uh, most of the time in, uh, well, in Paris, he works out, out of Paris, various places. Uh, Dmitry Gutov. Uh, from Moscow, um, and that's the good off. Well, this is the reference to to 19, uh, 1960s uh, socialist realist painting that he's referring to. Ironically, obviously, uh, Elena uh, Kovalina. Uh, who did uh, uh, performance work uh, in which she uh, stuck uh, uh, medals, pins and medals uh, into uh, upper part of her chest. Um, so it was a performance-based work. And then uh, Almagul Mendevieva from Kazakhstan, uh, working particularly with, uh, again, indigenous people who are being uh, very much displaced in terms of the, the growth of the cities, Almaty, uh, especially, and Astana, the capital. And this is uh, uh, Che Che Chen uh, from Taiwan. And uh, Miladin Stilinovic uh, from Croatia. So I called it zones of contact because uh, there was a moment when 
I, amongst other, I mean, a lot of people uh, who grew up uh, in the in the in the 70s and the 80s uh, believed in the in the kind of residual idea of internationalism, and um, it was before really I, I think that there was before uh, the discourse on the global and globalization had really uh, gone uh, gone deep, and um, and I had this idea that uh, zones of contact was very much about uh, st establishing a kind of network, an interrelation uh, between artists and, and like-minded people across the world. Uh, and that the Biennale was a place, if not a forum, for uh, the bringing together uh, of uh, these differences, different cultural differences and conventions, um, around which uh, one could find a certain kind of unity and forms of exchange. But uh, when I look at the work again, uh, I mean, these are, uh, these are about 17 or so artists, and there are 85 artists, so uh, it's a particular slice. Uh, but I think that it's amongst the most important work in the Biennale in retrospect. And it has more to do with uh, displacement, with migration, with crossing with borders and the border control, which has you know, not got any better, obviously, it's got worse. Uh, exile, erasure, disappearance. Uh, issues which, in fact, had informed me uh, as an art historian and, and, and teacher when I lived in, in South America, uh, obviously uh, coming off the back of the dictatorships, the era of the dictatorships in the 1980s, if not before, in Argentina, in Chile, uh, in, in, uh, in Paraguay, uh, in Brazil, in Venezuela, uh, et cetera. I mean, in a lot of places. Um, and uh, these, ha these had been formative. Uh, that experience was formative in terms of the way I th thought about contemporary art and what I thought were the issues that needed to be addressed. I don't think that zones of contact in, the, in, in when, when again, as I look back, I don't think zones of contact really captures that. But there was another part of me that felt, and I still, still uh, believe, you know, that there was another part of the story, which also was that this was not, this was not only, or not simply documentary, you know, that there was an aesthetic principle at work in the practice, you know, that it wasn't simply a kind of representational, if you will, relationship to the passing of history. Um, and, but I, I suspect that it got, that that aspect got hidden, uh, which is much of my fault, but I think that it, it could have, it could well have, um, it could well have brought that out more, uh, more strongly. One of the publications that came out of it, uh, we did three symposiums over the period of, of uh, June, July, and August. We did three symposiums. And one of the results of that was this book called After the Event. And I became very, uh, very committed to an exploration of this issue of the event. Uh, when does an event actually happen? When does it finish? Um, and again, you know, this is very much informed by uh, a great deal of work that was done uh, in the 19, late, uh, in, in the late 1990s uh, on the notion of the event. Many people wrote about it. Um, I was living in the States working at the Getty at the time, um, and it was very important, uh, the understanding of the event, uh, particularly uh, the, the work that was done by Kathy Carruth and uh, by others at that time uh, on, on the idea that the event, in fact, is unfinished uh, that trauma patients, the event is still going on in another form, takes another form, if you will, after the actual physical event. Um, and so the idea of the event became uh, extremely important. And in a way, the art, the artwork, the art practice also uh, pertained to this idea of being after the event, of a relationship back to something that physically happened. Um, and so... Um, from, 
from that point, uh, after the Biennale, uh, and such a massive event for me personally, as well as obviously my staff and for everyone involved, uh, I ended up uh, through various ways, uh, which I don't think are necessary to go into now, uh, but I ended up in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and Abu Dhabi was uh, a whole other world uh, because uh, my job in Abu Dhabi was to oversee the development of Sariat Island, uh, one portion of Sariat Island, one fifth of Sariat Island in terms of uh, the building, uh, the building of, the, of the museums there. At, uh, on the point of my arrival, there were seven museums that were planned. And um, um, there was, right, there were seven museums planned and they were, so uh, Sariat Island is here um, and here is the cultural district. So there were seven museums were uh, supposedly going to be built there. Um, and here is a rendition. Um, and here the, the, the Guggenheim uh, Abu Dhabi. I mean, these now are long have moved forward. You know, we're now this is five, four, or five years ago. Uh, this uh, this was to be. Uh, this, Tom Krenz was still running the Guggenheim at that point, um, and Frank Uri was the architect. Um, and here, uh, Nouvelle uh, was the architect uh, for the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, this was Zaha Hadid performing arts centre. Um, and over, over here uh, is uh, Andor, uh, the Marine Museum. Uh, and also up here uh, was the National Museum. Anyway, that, that, that covers uh, five of them. And then there was going to be a military museum and a science, art and science museum. So it was a crazy, uh, a crazy project, frankly. Uh, uh, the office seemed to be spending like a million a day. I don't know. I, I can't remember the figures now. There were too many zeros for me. Um, and uh, it was a nightmare to work with. Uh, I, I, and I can say it now. I say, say it then. Nightmare to work with Tom Krenz and, and Frank Geary. Um And thank God that Tom Krenz has left the Guggenheim. Uh, and uh, as we know, it was for... Uh, for economic reasons, I mean financial reasons. I mean this this was, I can't remember what how much it was going to cost. Um, anyway, my job was to oversee that. Now, why I'm mentioning it is because, uh, notwithstanding our discussion, notwithstanding the discussion of many of our colleagues and friends, uh, the idea of the universal still still has apparent an apparent strength, a strength in terms of uh, the aspirations of some museums to build collections which are universal. And the Louvre still believes that. And it goes back into the 1790s uh, when the founding of the Louvre originally, in which the idea of the universal coming out of the Enlightenment uh, was, stu was uh, advocated. Um, and we had endless meetings about what does the universal look like, actually, when you build the galleries? Do you put, you know, what do you put next to one another? Uh, and, you know, and where's the national in, in, in this? You know, at what point does the national, I mean, it's interesting, you know, yesterday in terms of, uh, I mean, David's uh, discussion about the national um, and, and, and what place it, it, it stands in, in this, in this uh, discussion. And, um, you know, I, I kind of want the national to end up, you know, being a, a fiction, uh, nationary, maybe like the imaginary, nationary, or something, some word that we would have to invent, not allow the, not allow the word uh, to end on the national, begin with the national, and then somehow, uh, deconstructed, a bit like the way Jimi Hendrix uh, deconstructs the national anthem. Uh, he plays the national anthem very well, and then with his guitar, and then he messes it up and destroys it. And by the end of the, of the tune of the, of the American national anthem, it, it no longer has any physical relationship, musical relationship to the national anthem. And that's what we should do to the national. 
Anyway, so Abu Dhabi was, uh, certainly the, the Louvre was very much committed to the idea of the universal. And in fact, the Guggenheim was committed to the idea of the international. The problem with the international, I mean, leave universal aside, the problem with the international uh, under the auspices of, of Krenz and the like uh, was that it uh, advocated still that the international, that there was a controlling point or a controlling principle. Uh, and that would be obviously reflected in the collecting policy and acquisitions of the Guggenheim Soho uh, or the Guggenheim uh, Fifth Avenue up, uptown. Um, and that they would add uh, a few examples of work from Lebanon, from Beirut, a few examples of artists from Brazil, a few examples from this and that. But still the international, the, the controlling principle was the collection of the Guggenheim, the, the proper collection. I mean, Guggenheim has changed enormously um, and um, it's attempting to, I, don't, I hate the phrase reach out, but it's attempting to engage properly uh, or to some degree properly with other parts of the world. Uh, as we know, uh, Jun Yap uh, has uh, made a, a, a tiny collection of a handful of artists, 16 or so works, uh, representing Southeast Asia uh, for the Guggenheim. Um, and I think, you know, it'll continue. And maybe, you know, in 50 years, there'll be something that will be modestly, you know, represent, you know, the rest of the world. Um, so it was good to leave. And after one year, I left. Uh, it was just, I mean, they can throw as much money to you as you want, but ultimately you realize that, you know, you're just prostituting yourself to, to be part of this. So this is the Zaha Hadid on the right. Uh, she was fired uh, because she developed a, a beautiful building uh, for performing arts with five concert halls. But none of the concert halls were acoustically sound. Uh, they all bled acoustically. So it was completely hopeless. Uh, it looked lovely, but in fact it didn't work. So uh, after, after about a couple of years, she was a crony with Krenz and, and, and one thing had led to another and, and so, but it just it was no good. So anyway, so that's that. Uh, so ultimately uh, uh, I ended up uh, three years ago uh, taking, I had a choice between taking a job in Moscow or taking a job in Singapore. But Moscow winter is not to be bared. Uh, and so I went for Singapore. Uh, Singapore has its own problems climatically, but we don't need to go to that. So I took a job there, um, and over the past three years, uh, we've, uh, we've produced too many shows. We do faculty-based shows, and we do external shows from different parts of Asia. Some of those, uh, some of those shows are, some of those shows are guest curated, and some of them are curated by us. We've done maybe in the three years about 140 shows. Uh, so, you know, it's, very, it's fairly demanding. I'd say that there's a show every, opening every 10 days or so. Next week, there's six shows are opening. And it, it's kind of, it's a sort of crazy uh, agenda, but I don't know, it's fun in some kind of, some kind of weird way. Um, now, there's sort of, uh, Two bases, I won't talk about the faculty-based shows. I may, there may be one or two that I'll show you here, but generally there are two uh, principal uh, types of shows and they are what we would call retrospective. I don't like the word retrospective because they're still alive. And so, you know, they review, major review shows and then uh, mid-career shows for some artists uh, and then, you know, emerging artists. Uh, emerging always has a problem with you feel like a cocoon or something, but emerging young artists, if you will. Um, so um, they, they, that kind of drives the uh, agenda. Uh, we try and uh, cover the whole of Asia, uh, including Central Asia, and we'll participate in the Singapore Biennale by doing a, a show on Central Asia, in particular Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan. Um, but uh, up until now, uh, most of our shows uh, have been from Asia, including, uh, of course, this part of the world, uh, China and its uh, uh, other parts of China. 
uh, non-mainland China, uh, and uh, Japan and Korea. So this is the Shebet, and there's some people in the audience who, uh, in today's audience, who uh, have contributed enormously uh, to what we do, and uh, uh, I, I won't name them all, but I'll thank them all just uh, being here. Um, but the first one uh, that I want to refer to is uh, Shebet, uh, Roberta Shebet, uh, a major artist uh, by anyone's standards in, uh, in Asia, if not uh, internationally. Um, and uh, a man who had never really shown uh, certainly this body of work uh, from about 1983 to now uh, outside of various venues uh, in, in the Philippines, in Manila in particular. And I'll just run through a couple um, of works here. We have six galleries, or six and a half galleries, and so and ICA one and two are the principal galleries. So most of what I'm going to show you happened in ICA one and two. Then uh, we did a show again uh, with the uh, with in, in particular with uh, Agnes and Osage, uh, and Agnes is here, uh, and uh, uh, of a generation of artists who had been informed or influenced uh, directly uh, by Shebet, uh, called Complete and Unabridged. Part one. Well, you know, what happened to part two? Uh, and then uh, Kabata, uh, Shihiro Kabata, uh, a young, uh, when I say young, mid-30s uh, artist from Japan. Artist from Japan. Uh, so we did uh, work. This, uh, I might just say, these are all ink drawings. So uh, you might have a massive uh, piece of paper and she'll, with a, what we call a biro, a ballpoint pen, and she'll just uh, work the surface. And these are small uh, blocks uh, of acrylic in which she's done these drawings. And here are the large, and these take a long time to do, as you can imagine. Uh, Jess McNeil, an Australian artist who lives in London, uh, this is a, a space in which she, uh, we, we installed a series of her works, uh, which are uh, uh, video projections, uh, which move uh, in a, often in a circular manner. Ian Wu, uh, also a teacher at La Salle. Uh, I did a, a mid-career show, uh, about uh, 50, uh, 50 works uh, over the past uh, 15 years. Uh, we do uh, some music uh, exhibitions. This is something that comes out of the faculty, but I'm very uh, keen to try and expand it in terms of the relationship between art and music. Forest was, a, a, again, a faculty-based show uh, in which uh, uh, one could listen to sound uh, uh, between these, uh, these stands, these easels. Uh, ink image was a kind of uh, a riff on uh, Chinese ink painting uh, led by a teacher and his students. Uh, Teddy D's work, uh, thanks again to, uh, to Enon who's here, uh, an Indonesian artist, and I just principally uh, selected uh, a sculptural 3D installation work by Teddy. These are TVs not to be lifted. 
Jeremy Sharma, who Orchard teaches, I went into his studio, which was a nightmare, and chose about 100 works in progress uh, to show a kind of uh, artist in studio practice. That's kind of seven, identified seven types of practice that he was working with. Uh, Yang Zhishao, uh, this, uh, this is an exhibition of, of uh, two and a half thousand uh, books, which are diaries uh, by Chinese uh, individuals, people uh, written in the, since, uh, since Mao, uh, and a documentation, in a way, uh, of, uh, of those diaries. And you can see them below, you can read them, if you can read Chinese, you can read them, and then the display, wall display of them. We did a show with the Royal Academy, which was a, uh, I, don't, I won't say a disaster, but it was not a good show. Um, it, it was a combination uh, of uh, uh, academicians from the Royal Academy in London uh, and artists from, uh, from Asia, uh, but it didn't, it didn't hang together. And then uh, I have just three more artists and that's it. Uh, Malenko Pravacci, uh, who's uh, from uh, Belgrade, uh, well, he's from the area, Novo uh, uh, Panchevo, uh, but has lived in Singapore uh, some 21 years, and I did a survey of his work, about 100 works, uh, from 1976 to now. Uh, Kei Takamoto, a uh, young uh, Japanese artist who lives in Berlin. She does a lot of work having to do with earthquake uh, and with uh, the destruction of, of uh, objects, uh, porcelain objects, and the reconstruction of them. Coded Transformations was a project which was developed by uh, Andreas Schlegel having to do with uh, technologies that can convert 2D uh, objects, 2D images, uh, into 3D objects, like a 3D camera, like this. I still don't understand, but... Inside the subject was a, uh, uh, a sound performance. There was this uh, installation and sound. Uh, and then the last couple... Uh, this one uh, was a group of artists from China, mainland China and Singapore, uh, having to do with uh, the border between China, uh, North Korea and Russia, and a documentation of that. It's a kind of uh, area that it's very hard to get into, um, and they did a, they did a, uh, uh, you know, some ten artists did a work on that. Uh, Shibigi, uh, who's an artist, uh, uh, Singaporean artist, uh, and uh, she invented a, a, a character called Raoul, and uh, it's a, uh, her show is about Raoul and the workings of Raoul uh, over the past 10 years. And the last... Uh, uh, the last artist uh, is Dawu, Dawu Tan, uh, who is an, uh, an older artist uh, based in Singapore, uh, from Singapore, uh, a major artist, uh, and we've just, uh, uh, coming down now, uh, just finished uh, an exhibition having to do with the past 25 years of Dawu uh, and, and Singapore. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Artist Village in 1988, um, and... Uh, a very important figure, uh, but little shown um, in, in Singapore. And there are sort of three parts to it. Uh, this is a sort of second part. Stones from the original uh, uh, La Salle, the Goodman Road, uh, that the founder, McNally, had used. And uh, he used them again, placed them 
then throws uh, mirrors over them um, and uh, then fences it. Um, and that's the sort of heritage or legacy of McNally uh, in terms of founding an art school and, and the arts in Singapore. And this is the final one, uh, a final image. Uh, and here, uh, here are radishes, uh, and they're, being, they're placed under this metal plate uh, and being kind of like squeezed and destroyed. And above it uh, is uh, just a, uh, a piece of a board on which is written the word Lee. Uh, and Lee, of course, is the Prime Minister of Singapore. Um, and uh, drawings, wonderful drawings, which are caged. Um, so this was a, uh, an installation of Dawu. So um, we can talk later at some point, uh, but thank you very much.